as we look at the picture, the question really is the glass um, uh, half empty? Can we hang on to some of those positive signs? Um, are, are there, um, is there hope uh, in targeting amyloid and its, its enzymes? Uh, or is the, um, uh, I guess that's the glass half full and we want to fill it further, or is the glass half empty? Uh, and uh, in fact, are we on the wrong track? And that's one of the issues that we're going to be discussing in this panel. I know Ken was telling me his investors say, why are you still investing in beta secretase? Isn't it already proven that the amyloid hypothesis is dead? That's one of the things we're going to be uh, addressing in this panel. I do want to say also, we won't be uh, just focusing on Alzheimer's. We do want to talk about neurodegenerative disease more broadly. In the case of Parkinson's, in case of the others, again, no disease-modifying medicines. Parkinson's reminds us that symptomatic treatments can be very valuable. L-DOPA does a lot of good to patients. It, of course, boosts the function of the nerve cells that remain. It doesn't slow the progression of the disease, but it can give great benefit for many years, five years, seven years, uh, or more. Um, uh, and other treatments as well, just a little plug for deep brain stimulation. Uh, this is a, a method to rebalance the circuits that get out of whack. Um, as a result of the, the loss of dopaminergic um, uh, input, and which is also showing great benefit. Again, it doesn't slow the progression of the disease. So we shouldn't neglect or disparage symptomatic treatments. They can be of great benefit to patients. But the big prize is to get disease-modifying medicines, and that's going to be the focus of our panel today. Um, now, uh, obviously, the, 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 the elephant in the room is uh, what is the status of the amyloid hypothesis? But rather than starting there, we thought we'd start with um, uh, a greater note of um, uh, enthusiasm and, and perhaps optimism, and, and start, um, not that there isn't uh, uh, optimism around the amyloid hypothesis, uh, but um, uh, we thought we'd start um, actually uh, in thinking about some of the scientific advances uh, that have occurred recently. Um, and uh, we'd like to start by asking Morgan um, to uh, address, uh, to, to tell us uh, what he thinks um, uh, uh, about recent advances in understanding the mechanisms of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, what, in your view, is most exciting? What discoveries are providing new entry points for development of therapies? And I should say, uh, we've asked each of the uh, uh, panelists to uh, be the lead uh, respondent on each of the questions, but then the others will weigh in as well. So Morgan will start, but the others will uh, add to that. So Morgan, what's most exciting? What are the greatest opportunities? Well, thanks for having me on the panel, and uh, thank you, Mark, for giving me the, the most positive question. Um, <laughs> So let me just preface my answer by saying that the old mechanisms, quote unquote, uh, I'm still interested in, I think are still exciting. But that said, among the recent advances, uh, I'm gonna focus on two areas that I think are particularly exciting. The first has already been mentioned, which is uh, prion-like spread of toxic proteins in neurodegenerative disease. And the second is inflammation in the brain, which I'll shorten as neuroinflammation. And I find these two areas um, most interesting because, firstly, these mechanisms apply broadly in neurodegenerative disease, not just in one particular disorder. And secondly, I think these mechanisms are targetable. So prion-like spread of... Um, toxic proteins in neurodegeneration. What do I mean by prions? They were originally discovered as infectious agents that cause rare degenerative diseases of the brain, such as mad cow disease and scrapie in uh, sheep. And prions are infectious agents that are misfolded proteins. So this is a very controversial finding when first discovered, it resulted in a Nobel Prize for Stan Prusner. But essentially, these uh, misfolded proteins bind to the endogenous normal protein and corrupt them, cause them to misfold, and thereby prop propagate a chain reaction such that the normal proteins of the body become transformed and form seeds to initiate the corruption of other proteins. So this is what is meant by prion-like spread. And recent evidence suggests that the toxic proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease, like tau, and Parkinson's disease, such as alpha-synuclein, they do seem to spread from cell to cell in the brain of human patients. And the slow progression is via a prion-like mechanism. Now, the significant thing uh, from a drug discovery point of view is that this cell-to-cell -cell transmission, which takes years, 
occurs at least in part through an extracellular phase when the protein, the toxic agent, becomes accessible to antibodies. So I think it opens up an opportunity for specific antibodies that bind to those toxic proteins and prevents them from doing their bad deeds onto the next cell. So if we can get enough antibodies in the brain, I think there is some potential for halting progression of uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's by targeting tau and alpha synuclein. And there are some preclinical uh, data to support that idea. And just an, as an aside, uh, it's interesting that tau pathology kind of comes up and accumulates about 10 or 15 years after amyloid. And so, and it correlates better with the um, cognitive decline. So an antibody against tau has an opportunity, if you like, for a, a later window to be effective than antibodies against uh, amyloid. So that's uh, prions. Um, now I'll just spend one or two minutes on neuroinflammation, which is inflammation in the brain. And it's been known for decades that there is inflammation in neurodegenerative disease. If you take a section of the brain, you'll find that the immune cells of the brain, which are called microglia, are activated. And there are too many of them. But it wasn't until the recent few years when I think the really compelling link to cause and effect came about, and that was through, of course, human genetics, which have identified a couple of genes, perhaps more than a couple of genes, which are risk factors for AD, Alzheimer's disease. And these genes are not expressed in neurons of the brain. They're actually expressed in the immune cells, the microglia. And the recent research indicates that these genes probably work by taking up the amyloid and other toxic proteins and then getting rid of them. So they're in a clearance mechanism. So I think it's, it's going to emerge, probably, that the ability of the immune cells or the inability of immune cells to clean out the brain in a tidy fashion of these toxic proteins that build up with age, that ability determines whether or not you're going to get neurodegeneration. So again, this offers, I think, another opportunity for uh, therapeutic intervention. I just want to draw one analogy here, which is that you know, when I was in medical school, a lot of chronic diseases of aging, such as atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, and so on, were not considered inflammatory diseases. However, it's sort of increasingly clear that there's a major inflammatory component of those diseases. So I think it would not be a surprise if inflammation of a chronic type also played a role in the pathophysiology of um, neurodegeneration. So, I mean, the only thing that we need to do then in drug discovery is find out which pathways in particular are abnormally activated in the inflamed degenerating brain and then to get the right drugs at the right concentration into the brain to have a beneficial effect. So, so progress on uh, both the, the understanding of, of toxic proteins that propagate as well as uh, increasing awareness of the role of the immune system. Risa, uh, any other uh, recent insights that you find uh, exciting and uh, uh, actionable? Um, well, I am still a person who uh, works a bit on the that almost dead hypothesis <laughs> uh, uh, amyloid, which we'll come back to. I agree, though, that these are two areas of real importance. And just on the, the tau propagation or other propagation, I think one of the real mysteries in neurodegenerative disease is why certain proteins propagate along certain networks. And that's a clue to the clinical symptoms we see in these diseases. On inflammation, I have to say I'm on the fence because I'm not clear if it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably both. Uh, but I'm a little more cautious about how easy it will be to go in with anti-inflammatory mechanisms or pro-inflammatory, knowing uh, the complex pathways, even in the genetics, even TREM2, there's a, it does good things in its inflammatory uh, piece and, uh, and more deleterious things. So that one I'm excited about, but I think it's going to be a little bit tougher. David? Well, I, I think the, the things that Morgan stated, I would agree with. Um, from a, another innovation that I think could really make a big difference is for Alzheimer's disease and other diseases of the brain is how do you get things into the brain better? And I think innovations of getting proteins into the brain, such as using antitransferrin receptor antibodies or other means, those could have a huge impact on all of these diseases. Samantha? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit mixed uh, along the lines of, of Risa in that I, I really like the idea of the spreading hypothesis. I do wonder, though, is that normal or what makes it pathologic? I'm not sure that we understand that yet. And, and in neuroinflammation, it's a, it's a challenge. It seems to have a, a beneficial role, at least the genetics tell us that there's a period at which neuroinflammation is doing something positive in cleaning uh, the brain, and then therefore why would we want to dampen it down? So I, I find that one a, a more difficult thing. I, I would add that perhaps we need to start thinking about different ways to target these targets. So in addition to antibodies and small molecules, some of these targets le lend itself to dialing them down and removing them. And so some of the small in inhibitory RNAs, for example, I find a, a quite exciting uh, area. Thank you. And maybe I can add, um, in terms of areas where we, we need more information, where perhaps there, there are some insights, um, we've talked a lot about the, the causes and the triggers of, of the, the, um, the disease, but um, we actually understand very little about how they actually cause the nerve cells to die. Um, we, earlier this morning, we heard about cancer, some of the oncogenes and tumor suppressors, but understanding the pathways that they function and can give other drug targets. And, and actually, uh, I, I, for one, am hopeful that over the next decade, we'll learn a lot about how these proteins are actually causing the, the nerve cells to die, which hopefully will give us uh, additional entry points for, for therapeutic development. Morgan, you... Yeah, let me, let me just respond on the neuroinflammation front. I mean, I think I was careful to s not say how we would... Um, try to modulate the, uh, the immune system. I think it's very likely though, I mean, this is my prejudice, that when someone has pronounced neurodegeneration, the inflammation that is going on is probably not doing any good. However, I can also, and I think it's more reasonable to think that early in the disease, a, a healthy immune function will be beneficial in clearing whatever kind of debris and cell uh, proteins are uh, accumulating. So in a preventative setting, you could, you could imagine a, a disease which boosts immune function, whereas in the later phases, like uh, you know, in the demented phases, maybe um, dampening inflammation would be beneficial. OK, thank you. So, so again, now, now let's, let's turn to the elephant um, in, in the room. Um, we've, we've heard how. Uh, the uh, challenging it's been uh, with the first drugs targeting uh, either uh, amyloid, a beta itself, or, or um, one of the um, cleaving enzymes, gamma secretase, uh, have been. Um, and again, this has led some to declare that the amyloid hypothesis is dead. Um, so what we're going to ask our panel now is whether they agree with this. Are Ken's investors correct in telling him to stop his base inhibitor uh, program? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and for this, we're going to uh, start with David. Sure. So I think I'll start by restating what two things. One, that Dr. Vogelstein st stated earlier this morning. He said, in the war against cancer, one of the first things to do is identify the enemy. And then Dr. Altshuler said, it's the biology, stupid. So it, to me, um, uh, what happened is in the late 1980s, when I first started to s figure out what was, look at what was happening in the Alzheimer field, um, I thought it was not clear that the amyloid beta protein was central to the disease. I thought it looked like debris in the brain, as was mentioned earlier. But um, I became convinced in 1990 and 91 that it absolutely is central to the disease. It's not the only thing central but it plays a key role, and it really is the genetics and the biology stupid. If you don't really read what's going on, you, you, I think you could get mis misled. So well, what happened? So it was known up until 1990 that if you had three copies of the amyloid precursor protein from which the amyloid beta peptide is derived, you have Down syndrome, but you also get 100% of those people get Alzheimer's disease. And it was subsequently shown if you have three copies of just the APP gene, you get Alzheimer's disease and a, and a linked condition called amyloid angiopathy. So in 1990-91, though, muta as you stated earlier, mutations in APP were found, the precursor to A-beta, and all of those mutations do one of two things. They either increase the production of A-beta, and since it's an amyloidogenic protein, that would increase the likelihood that it will aggregate, like other proteins like that, or some of the mutations that cause either Alzheimer's disease or amyloid angiopathy 
cause abnormal clearance or aggregation of the peptide, so a different mechanism. And then the other mutations that cause early onset Alzheimer's disease, then typically in the 40s, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, also cause an elevated production of the A-beta peptide. If you look at what's the biggest risk factor for any of the common diseases of man, it's APOE genotype, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. You have two copies of E4. You're 12 times higher risk to get Alzheimer's disease. Why is that? Well, we don't know the detailed molecular basis for that, but a lot of work strongly suggests that APOE does not affect the production of the A-beta peptide, but it affects its aggregation and clearance. And E4 does that much more than, than uh, E3 and E2. And um, if you look at people who have those alleles, they start getting amyloid deposition much earlier while they're still normal than people that don't have that allele. Okay, so other than the genetics, um, when people discover these genes that cause rare early onset form of Alzheimer's disease and they put those mutations into mice, the mice develop specific aspects of amyloid beta related pathology, including damage around the amyloid plaques and, and uh, also amyloid uh, angiopathy with hemorrhages, which is a feature seen. So it, it does not, they do not reproduce the whole disease, and that's probably because there are at least two pro main proteins that really are central to Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta, but as was alluded to earlier, tau as well. And so um, it's not surprising it doesn't recapitulate the whole disease. Um, some of the newer genetics that has unfolded over the last two to three years of new risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, again, implicates a beta as central to at least instigating the disease. So, for example, there's mutations in a, a rare mutations in a gene called ADAM10. This is alpha secretase, which cleaves a beta in the middle of the peptide, precluding its formation. And if you have certain mutations, you, you basically cleave it less well, causing more a beta be, to be produced by, by beta and gamma secretase. And then also, interestingly, in the last uh, year, it was found that if you have certain mutations in APP that, pro that cause less cleavage of APP at the base site, you're actually protected against Alzheimer's disease. So you get mutations that cause it, mutations that protect against it, risk factors that affect its clearance. I mean, it seems pretty obvious the molecule is important. But what, what, uh, that does not necessarily mean that we, if you just go ahead and target it at any point of the disease, you're going to get an effect. And it was known from the early 90s that if you look at people who have only very mild dementia from Alzheimer's and they die at that point, their head, their brain is already filled with amyloid plaques. It's not the beginning of the disease when you start getting symptomatic. And in fact, you already have tauopathy at that point. And I know Reese is going to address this more, but you know, the, the best effective therapy, if a beta can be targeted, is probably going to be as a prevention, primary or secondary prevention, and maybe it will still be an effective target for, uh, for treatment as well. We'll have to see. And finally, in terms of drugs that target a beta, there are some good ones that are being developed and are, are being tested, but I, would, I think a lot more innovation needs to go into how do you best either get rid of it or cut its production without getting side effects, and the industry has been putting a lot of money into this, and I think it, it needs more money. Right now, there's, uh, Alzheimer's disease costs, it's estimated, about $200 billion a year, more than cancer, and yet the NIH funds Alzheimer's disease eight times less than cancer. So I think we have a big disconnect as to how, if we're going to really make a, a more of an impact on this disease. So your answer to the question, is the amyloid hypothesis dead, is no, you don't agree. Uh, you believe that the amyloid hypothesis, the, the genetic data are in fact overwhelmingly in, in favor and, and other data as well, and it's really a question of, of when to, to, uh, to treat and how to treat. Right. I mean, that's I think that's where the field is. We don't know the answer to that, but yeah. that's where we are. So Samantha, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I would like to start by saying I completely agree with Dave for all the points that he's mentioned. Um, to Ken's question, though, and one of the reasons that analysts are flagging the is it dead it is potentially because that some of the very high profile phase threes that went ahead of, of this discussion um, were perhaps done with molecules that weren't as effective as the treatments that we are now seeing entering clinical trials. And so I, I think that that always leaves open the door for was it a failed treatment in, this, in the patients or was the drug not good enough? And so under those circumstances where nothing's effective, a lot of questions are raised. So by effective, you mean not hitting the target hard enough. Some of the other drugs that are coming through hit the target harder. And, and, and so the, the question is, did, you, did those 
initial trials really test the theory. So, okay. Morgan? Um, I completely agree with that the amyloid hypothesis is um, alive, if not kicking. And um, I only have one thing to add to a very comprehensive analysis um, that um, David um, pointed out. That is that there, beta amyloid is not the only kind of amyloid that causes disease, and it's, there are many other amyloids that clearly do cause disease where they're deposited, you know, whether it be in peripheral nerve or in the heart and the kidney and so on. So I think it would be almost outrageous to think that beta amyloid in the brain doesn't do some harm. Yeah. Risa? So I agree very much with what's been said, and especially the last point that I think the question is, is it too little or too late, or clearly both, uh, for uh, amyloid um, tests so far? And I think one other piece is that we don't fully know what species of A-beta is toxic. And I very much think back to the cholesterol wars in the 1970s and 1980s before people knew about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And I think we're a little bit there in a beta, not that there's probably a good a beta, but I think we're not really clear on what the toxic species are and how much we need to lower them and when. And when we answer those three questions, I think the amyloid hypothesis will very much be kicking. And so, um, uh, Ken, you can report back to your investors that uh, I'm going to include myself in this also. The five scientists out of five uh, believe very strongly that uh, A-beta is causal in Alzheimer's disease, that targeting it uh, is likely to be beneficial. It's a question of when and how. Um, and so uh, let's, let's turn to the, the, the question of when, um, and especially the point that's been made. Um, uh, I think someone said this er earlier today, maybe the horse is out of the barn when we, we go into disease that's, that's um, too advanced. You close the doors and, and it's too late. Um, so if we uh, do need to start treatment early, first of all, um, uh, how early do we need to, to, um, to, to start the treatment? Uh, and uh, what will it take to do that? Uh, what will the length, the expense, and the complexity of the trials be? Will, it, will they be prohibitive? And, and Risa, could you lead off on that? Right. So I, I think it does depend how early you have to treat a little bit on what mechanism you're going after. But I will make the argument for all neurodegenerative diseases, not just Alzheimer's disease, that earlier is better. So there's very compelling data that the process of Alzheimer's disease begins more than 10 years before symptoms. And this comes the genetic data, older uh, individuals in biomarker studies. And if you look at Parkinson's disease, we know that people don't get symptomatic until they've lost lost 80 or 90 percent of the key neurons in, in this region. And ALS, very similar story. So all the neurodegenerative diseases, these changes in the brain have been going on for a decade. I think in Alzheimer's disease in particular, when we talk about amyloid, this is a, a key issue. So I've heard many analogies about this, but one is that amyloid starts something, you know, the car running down the, the track, running down the, the hill. And that once you've kicked it off, you might be able to suck all the amyloid out of the brain, but it's not clear if the neurodegeneration is already moving full steam ahead that you're going to be able to um, stop the process. And I think the, the little animal data that's out there with more complex models uh, suggests that. So I think we have to go very early. The question is, do you have to go even before symptoms occur? And uh, I would say even five years ago, that would have been a heretical thought in Alzheimer's disease that we could identify people who have the process beginning in their brain and treat them before there are any symptoms. And I'm very excited that there are multiple trials starting this year that are using exactly that approach, either identifying people on the basis of the genetics that Dave mentioned, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, and a trial that I have the honor of leading, which is identifying people of amyloid in their brain on the basis of PET scans, but don't yet have any symptoms. This may sound crazy, but when is cholesterol lowering most useful before people get a stroke or a heart attack? And I think this will ultimately be the case in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease. The one thing I'll say is that I think combination therapy, and maybe we'll talk about this a bit later, this makes me hopeful that someday we will be able to treat later in the disease because just like in, in cancer or other mechanisms, when we come diseases where there are multiple targets, multiple mechanisms to go after, we might be able to treat people later. I'm a clinical neurologist and it would just pain me to say to somebody who already has dementia, there's nothing we can offer you at this point. 
but I think it's unlikely with a single monotherapy that by the stage of dementia will have full impact, and I hope we'll have combination amyloid tau and uh, uh, at that point. And then the last thing I'll say is this, and uh, maybe this will lead into what Samantha will talk about, is the ability to do these trials earlier and earlier and to not make them prohibitive really means that we need better uh, markers. We need more sensitive biomarkers to really track change, again, 10 years before dementia, and we need more sensitive cognitive tests to do that. And I'm really excited excited with these trials, the Diane trial, the Alzheimer prevention, and the A4 trial and the amyloid positives, that we will use these trials to develop better markers, to be able to look at progression without relying on the current outcomes we have of, of following people uh, purely with um, cognitive tests and nursing home placement. Morgan, thoughts about um, the when do we need to start treatment and, and uh, what challenges that poses? Well, yeah, I guess I agree, of course, that um, the earlier the better. I'm not absolutely convinced that, you know, uh, treating late will have no effect at all. Um, I think there could still be some benefit. We just need to do the uh, right experiments. So Genetech does have a trial going on in Colombia on a Alzheimer's disease, um, large kindred, and starting treatment roughly 15 years before um, the patient's parents got um, Alzheimer's dementia. So I think that will be one of those trials that will address the question whether you can prevent um, the onset of dementia by treating in a pre-symptomatic um, stage. I, I mean, this is sort of crystal ball gazing, but I think that within 10 years, we probably will have a treatment that can help slow down the disease or prevent the onset of the disease. And it, then, and if we have the biomarkers, and I think we are close to those kind of biomarkers, uh, in the, for instance, in the spinal tap CSF, um, I think I, I can imagine a time when uh, you reached 50 years of age and you're curled up on your gastroenterologist's um, exam table and he's about to insert the scope uh, to do the colonoscopy. At the same time as that, someone will stick a needle in your back and take a few mLs of CSF to see whether or not you're at risk or already developing the first signs of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And then you could be enrolled in a um, preventative kind of treatment. David? I, I think uh, what Morgan just said is something I've been talking about for 15 years. I think it's going to re probably require f to delay the onset of disease. It will re require preclinical diagnosis and treatment. And one of the challenges in the clinical trials right now is that because the disease is slow in terms of the cognitive progression from normal to abnormal, if amyloid starts building up, let's say, 15 years before symptoms, and then even neurodegeneration starts before symptom build up, is there, are there ways that one can develop that track not hitting, whether you're hitting target with the therapy, but whether you're having a functional impact so that you don't have to wait five years to see if you have an effect of your drug or treatment. I think that's a big challenge right now that we don't have an answer to. Samantha, early treatment? Yeah, I, I also believe that going earlier is going to be more beneficial, but as somebody who works in a pharmaceutical company, I've got my eye on the fact that that may mean that we will be treating people for 10, 20, or 30 years, and the statin analogy is a very good one, both scientifically but also as a pharmacology that it needs to be very, very safe to be able to do that. Great. And um, I, I just want to echo, uh, first of all, agreeing with the, the importance of, of going early to see how much benefit we can have. But I'm sort of with Morgan myself, that I, I think that um, uh, I'm not giving up hope on treating later, certainly in mild patients. And again, Jan highlighted the, um, the subset analysis in the Solonuzumab trial that did show a benefit. It was pre-specified by a secondary endpoint, uh, and that gives, gives hope. So um, and a little bit like cancer, uh, if you can get into pre-metastatic disease, you can hope for long-term remissions or even cures. Um, in metastatic disease, you may only be able to hope for delays, but that's better than nothing. And, and maybe that's similar in the case of Alzheimer's disease. I think uh, time will tell. But let's, let's focus on this continuing on the, this issue of, of detecting early. And maybe, Samantha, you can um, uh, lead off in, in uh, sharing thoughts about um, what advances are needing, needed to evaluate efficacy 
uh, and also to subset patients, and, and how would those advances help clinical development? How will we get there? Yes, thank you, Mark, and I appreciate getting the question of how to fix it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe in going earlier, and as you've heard, um, Alzheimer's disease is, is a progression of cognition and function, and, and that's actually how you would clinically measure somebody's progress in disease or, or in a clinical trial. And the challenges of going earlier, unfortunately, are that people are less affected. They, are, they, they do not have deficits in their function any longer, and their cognition deficits are very, very mild. And so one area of innovation that is desperately needed is to generate more sensitive measures of cognition such that we can detect these patients and follow changes um, uh, through a clinical study. And, and such activities are going on. Uh, the existing validated scales of cognition do have some questions that are more um, sensitive in these early stages. And so if, if you take out those questions and generate a new composite, um, such as has been done by uh, ESI with their ADCOM or AstraZeneca with ProADAS, then you can, in a more sensitive way, track changes in those patients. We also saw earlier this year a... Um, step forward from the agency in the US in, in terms of encouraging that such endpoints be used in earlier stages and even removing the co-primary um, in, in pre-dementia stages. So that's, that's very encouraging. But in addition to cognition... The co-primary of disability in addition to cognition. Yeah. So, yeah. In, in addition to um, clinical scales, there's a lot of in innovation in biomarkers, and we've heard this mentioned a, a few times today. And biomarkers are necessary in a, in a couple of contexts in, in clinical study. Um, one is to demonstrate to the authorities that we are indeed modulating the disease itself. So you're having an impact on the underlying disease pathophysiology. But also, again, for, for somebody in drug development, it would be very nice if these biomarkers could actually show us a signal of change uh, earlier in a clinical study. I think we've heard only once today that these studies are 18 months plus, which is really a very long time um, of clinical study before knowing that something has happened. We do have some candidate biomarkers. Um, there are a number of modalities such as uh, volumetric imaging of specific brain regions or indeed whole brain measures, PET imaging of amyloid and tau. We, we heard Jan talk about the tau being implemented in, in the Lilly studies. Um, there's also metabolism and CSF markers of, of biochemical endpoints which also reflect um, changes in neuronal health and neurodegeneration. These are very promising but since we don't yet have an effective therapy, we don't yet know if they will respond to change uh, due to a treatment or if they will predict that that treatment will ultimately be effective. So there's a bit of a catch-22 right now. Biomarkers are used in another context, and we've heard about selection of patients and accuracy of patients. What occurred in, with the readouts of bapanuzumab and solanuzumab in the last couple of years was the perhaps surprising but very uncomfortable find that between 20 and 30 percent of patients in those clinical studies did not even have amyloid in their brain. And Jan said, that's why would we treat somebody who does not have amyloid in their brain, which is absolutely right. But for me, it also means that 20 to 30 percent of people in those studies could not respond. And so your, your probability of success in those clinical trials is, is really hampered by that. And so it's extremely encouraging to see at least three sponsors now running clinical studies that have um, detection of amyloid as a baseline measurement before they go in. I think that's really great. And then to a, a final innovation, sorry, Mark. Um, it's, it's not just about biomarkers and endpoints. We're seeing some great innovation in clinical trial design. We're seeing biomarkers used for decision making. We are seeing interims um, in clinical studies such that you are studying patients and then you are changing dose, such as in the ESI, adaptive design, or in Merck, deciding you're safe and tolerable and initiating other studies. So there's, there's innovation across the domain, which is very positive. That's great. Thanks. David, thoughts on, on um, evaluating efficacy, subsetting patients, but also you've been a pioneer in identifying uh, biomarkers. Uh, people here may, may not know that David really has been a, a pioneer in, in studying um, uh, markers in CSF fluid 
that are predictive of Im imminent demise of patients who are non-demented. Can you tell us about the, the predictive value of, of, of those uh, biomarkers? Right. Well, so the current biomarkers that are available, whether they be CSF measuring amyloid beta-42 and tau or amyloid imaging, um, more data for CSF, but if, you, if you're somebody who's normal, who have abnormalities in both of those markers, um, your risk of converting from normal to very mildly demented over a five-year period is about 80 percent. So they're actually pretty accurate at predicting prognosis. But one of the things that I think we really need that we don't have are, are two things. One is that there's, of course, amyloid beta and tau appear both to be critical in Alzheimer's disease. But there's other, there's even two other proteins that accumulate in some cases of Alzheimer's disease. One is synuclein that can also cause, uh, be involved in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. So I think something like 30 percent of people with Alzheimer's disease have synucleinopathy in their brain, and we don't have a way to identify that accurately by imaging or fluid markers now. And then there's also potentially a contribution of a protein involved in ALS called TDP43, and we don't have a way to image or measure that in fluid. So those are two things that would be helpful to know, just like subsetting patients with different cancers to get the full idea of really what's going on in somebody's brain. And then the other thing that would be very helpful for screening, um, because all these tests will probably be pretty expensive, is a blood test to at least say, well, okay, are you very likely to have a problem? And then if you did, then you'd go on to further testing. So we don't have an LDL or HDL cholesterol to say you're at high risk yet, and I think that would be a really big advance. Okay. Morgan? Um, I really don't have much to add, except uh, in addition to all those um, approaches, I think it would be um, essential to genotype patients in the future as well. So not just APOE, but all the other risk um, genes right. implicated in AD. Risa? So what I think we need most is a short-term predictive biomarker that says if you change a beta, you change tau, do you make the brain work better? And I think, unfortunately, despite promise of functional imaging, this hasn't borne out yet, but I still think that's what we need. We need something in three or six months that will tell us what will happen in three years. And so I, I want us to keep uh, working on that. Um, tau, pet tau imaging was mentioned, and I think this will potentially revolutionize how we think about this, particularly as we go earlier and earlier, so we can directly ask the question, if you change a beta, do you change the spread of tau? And I think that may be e more easily done with imaging than with spinal fluid, even though I think spinal fluid is a terrific marker, but I think there's more dynamic range probably in the tau imaging and how it spreads anatomically along these uh, networks. So I have high hopes. And then last, on the cognitive, I think we have to innovate in cognitive markers. Um, so we're using an iPad as a secondary outcome in the A4 trial. It's also going to be used in Diane because eventually when we do these prevention trials, we can't bring 10,000 people into the clinic. We're going to do it just like the cardiovascular TIMI trials do at home, and we need ways of assessing cognition sensitively over years, and I think we're getting there. Great. Well, before we, we open it up for questions, we thought we'd do a lightning round where I've, I've asked um, each of the, the panelists, um, and not to share with the others in advance, uh, to give us um, their uh, uh, thoughts on, on um, uh, what are the new targets, drugs, or approaches that you're most excited by in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. We, this has been uh, very focused on Alzheimer's, as I warned you, but in, in, in this round we'll hear what their thoughts are about others as well. And I've asked them to divide these, um, their excitement uh, into three categories uh, about um, uh, compounds or approaches in the clinic, in late preclinical, so approaching the clinic, uh, and early preclinical or, or discovery, sort of uh, earlier science. Um, and that they should just give the names of those, not elaborate, because we won't have time, uh, but maybe if they want to elaborate on just one of, of the things that they suggest. And maybe we'll start at the far end. Risa, oh, would you like no. to go down the list? <laughs> um, boy, I'm not sure I, I have it categorized exactly as you uh, said, but I, um, I'm very, I'm excited in terms of what's in the clinic now of um, beta secretase inhibitors and the combination potentially of beta secretase inhibitors and antibodies, because I think you can both uh, turn off the spigot and improve the drain, and that combination is really important for uh, a beta. I'm very interested in approaches in tau 
And um, I think uh, going after, as David is in the secreted forms of tau or what might uh, cross uh, is critically important. And then in the, in the dream world, very, very preclinical, I'm interested uh, in this idea that you'll go after something that is a mechanism of protein misfolding that's ubiquitous to all proteins. Um, and I don't know what that'll be. I thought that PERC article is very interesting, but I think ultimately we need something that really talks about why proteins misfold across all of these diseases. Morgan? Um, in the clinical stages, I like anti-A beta. I think that um, the best antibodies have not yet been tested for Alzheimer's disease or, or in the best um, experiments yet. Um, I also like base inhibitor and especially if they're going to be turn out safe, which is the main concern, I guess. In the preclinical area, I like antibodies to tau, antibodies to alpha-synuclein, and in the earliest phases, um, the fantasies around neuroprotection and mitochondrial um, health boosting, those are what are interesting for me. David? Well, I don't have anything to add to what Morgan said for one and two, so anti-beta and base I still think are promising in the clinic now. I think as a proof of concept for things that will be in the clinic, just will an anti-tau antibody really have a, an effect or not on blocking spreading and disease? And then the third thing, I think, even though it goes back to the A-beta hypothesis, I'd, I'd be really interested to see if you could, whether it be through a secretase inhibitor or, or active immunization, if you could prevent A-beta from aggregating in the first place, what would that, would that really prevent the disease? That'd have to start a lot earlier than anything we're doing now, but I think that is the best <coughs> promise to really totally delay the disease. Right. Samantha? So in the earliest of early discovery, I also think the protein misfolding uh, mechanisms are very interesting, although I, I don't think we're going to find one common uh, mechanism, probably not. Um, for the late preclinical, the antibodies against tau and the spreading is a very interesting area. And then in the clinic, I'm very much um, supporter of the beta secretase approach. Um, for me, the genetics is very compelling, both for amyloid but also beta secretase. The pharmacology of those molecules is phenomenal compared to anything else we've seen. And it, the mechanism of action does lend itself to this idea that it could be used in a preventative um, uh, positioning later on. Um. Great. Thank you. So now we'll, we'll open it up um, uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, Alan. Can, can you turn it on? The mic. the mic. If we could turn on the mic, please. So the importance of biomarkers is clear. Dr. Sperling alluded to this. But uh, just a cautionary note and, and maybe a comment on how rigorous and how tight the predictive value in terms of the real endpoint of disease. You know, as the former director of the Diabetes Institute at NIH, I was very disappointed at what's happened with the DPP-4 inhibitors, with the ACCORD trial. We have this wonderful biomarker for glycemic control, hemoglobin A1C. It unequivocally predicts the microvascular complications, but not the much more common and serious macrovascular complications. How do we know that these biomarkers are really rigorously protective? So I think the only way we're going to know is we're going to have to run a trial in which we get a clinical signal. We embed every biomarker we can think of and even some we don't know about yet. We bank spinal fluid and other things to look at and then say what was predictive. So I can say in the prevention trials, at least in the A4 trial, the outcome is clinical. Even though we're talking about 10 years earlier, the primary outcome is change on a cognitive composite because I don't trust a biomarker now to tell me what's going to happen. But we will get there. We have to have a drug that works, and we have to have enough biomarkers and enough people to be able to then look backwards and say what predicted change, because we can't run every prevention trial over five years. Uh, it, we just won't get there in time. A question here. In essence, the brain consists of neurons with 10 cells to protect those neurons. How do you know, or do we know, that really is the microglia that's the culprit uh, for making these proteins versus the astrocytes or some other cell which we, I, I, I'm not aware of? Who wants to take that? 
Morgan. Um, well, um, you're absolutely right. We don't know if it's the microglia versus the astrocytes or even you know neurons. Um, all we can do is make hypotheses based on genetics and cell biology and how the, the pattern of expression of those uh, genes implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So um, when I mentioned only microglia, I was only just trying to simplify the, uh, my thesis. Other comments? Or... Oh, great. Um, questions? I saw another hand over here. Ron? If, as seems likely, there will be therapies that work, maybe it's beta secretase uh, molecules or others in the next five, ten years, we, we heard earlier from uh, the, uh, uh, the earlier panel that the, the earlier you go, the better chance, it seems, from the available data that you're going to actually make an impact. And so presumably there's no limit to that. If you start right at the very beginning of the process, you can prevent the whole thing if the molecules turn out to be active, as they probably will. And that's going to bring up a public health and economic issue, which we've also been talking about today, which is we'll need much better biomarkers, it seems, so that you know who to treat. Because if you're going to have people on these drugs for 10, 20, 40, 50 years, you can't have everyone who's at risk. You have to have the people who really are going to develop the condition. Who's working on those biomarkers now, and how much effort is being put into that? Because that's going to be a huge economic concern. Well, I think there's a lot of effort going into, well, there's already been a lot of work done on fluid markers like CSF, and imaging markers, there's an incredible amount of work. There's a consortium of individuals interested in trying to develop blood-based biomarkers. There hasn't been a big success at that yet, but I think there's still promise in that regard. But if you think about this like um, cardiovascular disease, it's pretty analogous. I mean, if you're, screen let's say you screen people in their 40s or 50s for something that might lead to Alzheimer's disease later, I mean, and they have to go on a treatment for the next 30, 40 years, that's not really any different than what happens now with cholesterol uh, treatment. Same, same kind of thing, really, if you find the right biomarkers. Well, we have excellent assays for cholesterol and subfractions of cholesterol. Right. I'm not sure we, we yet have all the assays we need uh, for early I, stage risk. I think we're pretty close to that, at least with CSF. That may not be the most attractive fluid to obtain, but we're pretty, and, but the measurements that done at a single place can be very accurate and very predictive. There, there are struggles in terms of technology across sites, but I think it's, it's not so bad, actually. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, we talked about ecosystem earlier today. So these biomarkers are being worked up in academic sites where discovery and even some of the initial validation is done. There are companies that are dedicated diagnostic companies who are progressing these through the type of regulatory pathway needed, which is one of the biggest challenge. And the pharmaceutical companies are very motivated as well. So I think there are a number of partners trying to ensure that this does happen. Okay. Risa? And just I think that this is critical for the next 10 and maybe 15 years that we develop these biomarkers to take individuals in secondary prevention trials, meaning people already have pathology but not symptoms. But ultimately, I don't think that's what we'll do. I think if these trials are successful, we will figure out a way to go to primary prevention, um, especially if immune uh, therapy works. We're going to figure out a way to vaccinate people and vaccinate people before they have immune system problems that have uh, come up in active vaccines in older individuals. So someday, I think we will get to a point where we don't need those biomarkers, but desperately we need them in the next 10 to 15 years to get a proof of concept trial that tells us we're on the right direction. Great. Well, I know that there, there are other questions, but I do, uh, we need to keep on, on time for the, um, uh, the meeting. And uh, maybe what I, I can just summarize uh, what we, we've heard today, uh, that our, our knowledge of neurodegeneration, I, I think it's fair to say, is much further behind our knowledge of cancer, what we heard from Bert Vogelstein uh, this morning. But we do have some of the key players, uh, certainly some of the triggers that have been revealed to us through genetics and, and deep biology. Um, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, there's certainly a consensus on this panel, and if I add uh, uh, Huda and Jan and others who spoke uh, earlier today, um, uh, hope and optimism about targeting um, uh, amyloid, A-beta, and uh, the, the um, uh, cleaving enzymes, uh, but with a recognition that we have to intervene at the right time, that we may not know the best patients yet, 
um, and that we have to have uh, drugs that hit the targets hard. Um, but uh, I think uh, a lot of hopefulness uh, on the panel that we will see positive clinical data building on the, the, uh, the glimmer that we have from the, the first Lilly trial um, uh, last year. Um, and, but still, a lot of work to do uh, in terms of identifying bi biomarkers, being able to assess efficacy and to do it um, in a way that's uh, perhaps uh, easier and uh, more affordable. Uh, and finally, I do want to come back to the fact that if we, we compare this to cancer, in cancer we learned about oncogenes and tumor suppressors starting in the 80s and, and early 90s, and we target them. But um, as was emphasized today, we also target the pathways when the, 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 the oncogene or tumor suppressor is not itself directly targetable. We have very little knowledge about the pathways, what happens after a beta, uh, we know tau is down there somewhere, but what's between a beta and tau and what's downstream of tau? If we had more information on the degeneration pathway, um, we would be able to have more points of, of entry and intervention. So, and there really what we need is, is more research, fundamental research to understand that so we can try to catch up with cancer. Hopefully we can um, shrink the timelines compared to what's happened in cancer because we have better tools and, and we can learn from uh, what they've done. Uh, but clearly there's a lot more to do even beyond the players that we've discussed today. So I'd like to close and, and thank um, the, the panelists again, Samantha, David, Morgan, and Risa. Thank you very much. Thank you.